for the information. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here for this second session on ergodic theory and dynamical systems. So this morning, we will listen to Anaxtina, Julian Cedro, Wild Bassoon, and then Mark Pulicott. So we can start with Anaxtina. Okay, so thank you very much, Roman, for the invitation. So in this talk, uh, we will study extreme value loss and the rare event point process for the mendel pomo map. And we will see that based on this dynamical system, we may construct an example for which the usual interpretation of the extremal index does not hold. So I will start with some basic no notions of uh, the extreme value theory. So we consider stationary stochastic process, x0, x1, and so on, with marginal distribution function f, and let f bar be equal to 1 minus f. So in the extreme value theory, we, we usually study the distributional properties of the maximum, mn, of the n first random variables as n goes to infinity. So here we have a classical definition. So we say that we have an extreme value law, EVL, for MEN, if there is a non-degenerate distribution function H, and for all positive tau, there is, exists a sequence of levels, UN, which depend on tau, such that n times the probability of exceeding the level goes to tau as n goes to infinity, and the limiting law for MEN is given by h by of tau. And um, essentially this condition too says that among n observations, the expected number of exceedances is approximately given by a constant, um, so for n sufficiently large, okay? And this condition too is an excellent sufficient condition for three to hold uh, in the IID case, so if the random variables are independent and identically distributed, this condition two is the necessary and sufficient condition for three to hold with h bar of tau given by the standard exponential, okay? Exponential of minus tau. Uh, a natural question is what happens if the uh, random variables are not independent? For that, we have here classical conditions, so condition D first. This condition D of UN says the following. So if we look at events of the type XI less or equal than UN and consider any two blocks of events of this type with a time gap between them, okay? So these two blocks become more and more independent as the time gap grows. This is condition D. Now, in the, in the next slide, sorry, no. I have problems. <laughs> condition, here I have condition D prime, and this condition essentially uh, forbids the concentration of exceedances. So it bounds the probability of having more than one exceedance in a certain time interval. And under the two conditions, D prime and uh, D and D prime, Ledbetter have proved that the limiting law for MEN is the same as in the independent case. Okay, now we have another classical result which only imposes condi uh, condition D that says that if D of UN holds for the stochastic process and if we have a limiting law for MEN, then there exists some tau. Um, between uh, theta, sorry, between zero and uh, one, such that h bar of tau is given by the exponential of minus theta tau. Okay, and uh, this theta is called, uh, in this context, the extremal index of the stochastic process. Okay. Now, uh, we will consider stationary stochastic processes arising from dynamical systems. For that, uh, we consider a discrete dynamical system, X, B, P, and F, where X is a topological space, B is Borel sigma algebra, F is a measurable map, and F is an F invariant probability measure. Sorry again. 
Um, so in this context, we consider uh, the stochastic process simply by evaluating a certain observable function along the orbits of the system, okay? So here we are assuming for now that phi is an observable which achieves a global maximum at a certain point of the phase space that we denote by zeta. And I'm assuming also that it is of the form, so phi of x is a g of the distance between x and zeta, uh, where g has a global maximum at zero and is a strictly decreasing bijection for an neighborhood of zero. Okay. So essentially, if at time j, we have an exceedance of level u sufficiently large, uh, then we have an entrance of the orbit of x in the ball centered at zeta with radius uh, g minus one of u, okay? So exceeding the level is the equivalent to enter in this ball here, centered at zeta. So motivated by the application to dynamical systems and also by the work, very inspiring work of Kolea of 2001, uh, so we considered um, a condition D2, weaker than condition D, with the advantage that it follows from sufficiently fast decay of correlations. Okay, and we have seen that under the two conditions D2 and D prime, we still we still have the same the same law. So uh, the law is the same as in the independent case. Um, next, we will see what happens to periodic points. So we su suppose that zeta, at which phi achieves uh, the global maximum, is a repelling periodic point of period P. So the periodicity implies that for uh, U sufficiently large, there are points of the ball that after P traits return to the ball. Okay, And we also suppose that we have backward contraction implying that there exists a parameter, theta, between zero and one, such that uh, the set of the points that start at the ball and after P traits return to the ball is another ball of smaller radius around zeta, whose measure for U sufficiently large is approximately given by the measure of the initial ball times one minus theta, where theta in this case is one minus backward contraction rate of Fp at, uh, at zeta, okay? And we immediately observe that in this case, this D prime does not hold because since uh, zeta is periodic, um, the exceedances appear concentrated in time, okay? So we, if we have um, one exceedance in principle, we uh, have more exceedances in, in the next iterates. So we have what we call clusters of exceedances. And for that reason, D prime does not hold. So a natural question is uh, what type of law we obtain in this case? Okay, for that, we have to define some events. So we start with the initial ball. Here we have the points of the ball that after P iterates do not return to the ball, and this corresponds to this annulus here. And we have to define to establish the next result some more events, API of U, which is the points that at iterates I are in the ball, but after P iterates do not return to the ball. And also the event QPSL of U, the point set between iterates S and S plus L minus one are not in the annulus. Okay, so with this notation, uh, in order to present results, we have to impose some mixing conditions. So conditions DP and D prime P, and these two conditions are similar to the previous one, previous ones. So D2 and D prime, uh, simply by replacing uh, balls by annuli, okay? Um, for example, in this condition, so uh, I recall that condition D prime uh, forbids the concentration of exceedances. This prime P forbids the concentration of uh, uh, clusters of exceedances. Okay, so entrances uh, in annuli instead of poles. And here the result with Josh Freitas and Mike Todd that says that under the previous conditions, um, then the limiting law for MEN is given by the exponential of minus theta tau 
And I recall that this theta is simply uh, given by one minus the backward contraction rate of the uh, FP at zeta. And this uh, theta can be obtained simply doing, uh, making this limit. So the limit of these quotients. In the numerator, we have the measure of the annulus. In the denominator, the measure of the ball. And this is the result. Sorry. Okay. I don't know what is happening. Okay. Another um, important, important and related problem is the study of the of rare event point processes, which count the number of exceedances in uh, uh, certain time intervals. So, um, in order to obtain a non-generate limiting process, we essentially count how many exceedances we have of the level UN among NT observations. Okay. And uh, uh, we recall that among N observations, by that condition two, the expected number of exceedances is approximately tau. So among NT observations, the expected number um, of exceedances is approximately tau t. Okay? And in fact, we have seen that um, if D2 and D prime hold, then we have in the limiting um, a Poisson process with mean tau t, this means with intensity uh, tau. Um, a natural question is what happens if zeta is periodic? If zeta is periodic, we know that the prime does not hold and uh, because the exceedances appear concentrated in clusters, um, this means that if we have one exceedance, then in next iterates we may see more exceedances. And uh, in order to establish the results, we have to consider some more events. So, I don't know what's happening. I think it's this slide. So, um, uh, other events. So this, uh, this event here is the initial ball. Okay, here we have the initial annulus. I'm sorry, this is not working. No, I don't know what's happening. I, I will try to interrupt sharing. Okay, now try to share it again. No. Yes. Uh, do you see? No. No, the sharing of the no. screen is not working. <laughs> there is some problem. I'm trying to share it, but no, it is not working. <laughs> Share the screen, previsualization. No. Okay, should I? Um, I, I will uh, ask help to George okay. because it's here, but I think it's uh, it is not working. Uh, thank, you. thank you. No. 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 You you stop uh, sharing and then you could not. Uh, Share again, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. George is helping me. <laughs> Maybe in your computer, George. Yeah. I will try to to leave Zoom. Yes. Ah, okay. okay. And I'll try to. Okay. Let's try. Yeah, but. Uh... 
Sorry, Mario. Uh, I, I, I'm a little bit afraid because if you left and then you enter and then the, the production have to give you permission and I don't, I don't ah, think they are okay, okay, ready okay. To, to, to that. So I, I'll try to um, send it to George and try in the computer of him, okay? Uh -huh. Meanwhile, I'm trying to get help from the production. Okay. okay. Yes, it is not working. No. Do you want to try to um, um, open yours, for example, Julian, just to see if uh, it is a, a technical problem for all of us? Okay, let me let let me try to share my screen. Yes. So, can everybody see? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. So, my my connection is okay. Okay, yes. okay. Thank you, thank you. I'll try no to problem. send it to George. Sorry. I don't know what's happening. I ask for help from the production. Let's thank you. They... Yeah, it's strange because yes, we were seeing it's the this situations with computers. Yes. I'm sorry. So, um, Jerome uh, is saying that uh, try to close completely your PD, your document, your presentation, ah, okay. and okay. then open it again. Thank okay. you, Jerome. Thank you very much. Um. Now something is blocked. <laughs> uh, okay, let's try. Pronto, já fechei o copisto. Vou abrir outra vez. Está. Problem solved. Yes, yes, I can see it. Okay. Yes, it, okay. it works. I'm so sorry. No so problem. You are okay. Okay, I put. Okay. No, now the events. So the initial ball, uh, now we consider the points of the ball that do not return to the ball, the annulus, and now we uh, subtract the two events. So the ball minus the annulus, and we obtain the smaller ball. Now we repeat process, okay? So we go to this ball and consider the points of this ball that after P traits do not return to the ball. The second annulus that I denoted by AP1, and then the second ball less the second annulus, the third ball, and so on. And we have this structure of balls and annuli. So if we have an entrance, for example, in the second ball, we have what we call a cluster of size two. So we are in the ball, so we have an exceedance. In, uh, after P-treats will be in this more exterior annulus. 
So we are still in the ball, another exceedance. And then after pH rates will be outside the ball. So no exceedance. So we have two exceedances. Okay. The first one, then the uh, second one, which is smaller than the previous ones, the previous one. And then um, we have no exceedance. Okay. Now, uh, in order to establish the uh, results about the limiting process, we have here the mixing conditions that we have to impose. So these uh, mixing conditions are similar to the previous ones again, but now simply adapt to uh, point processes, okay? So it involves events uh, that count the number of exceedances in, 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 in set or, uh, certain intervals. And now, again, a problem with the slide, okay. Um, uh, the results with uh, uh, George Freitas and Mike Todd, that says that under the previous conditions, the uh, limiting uh, point process is a compound Poisson process with intensity theta tau and multiplicity distribution function. So the distribution function of the size of the cluster is given by the geometric law with parameter given by the uh, extremal index. Okay. Now system examples, systems to which uh, we can apply directly the above results. So our uniformly expanding maps on circle or interval, piecewise expanding maps like Rishlik maps, IR dimensional expanding maps, for example, like the ones studied by Soso. And for this type of systems, we have a dichotomy. So if the point zeta is non-periodic, then the relevant point process converges in distribution to a simple Poisson process. If the point is periodic, then we have a convergence to a compound Poisson process. Um, with uh, uh, George Freitas, Mike Todd, and Sant Vianti, we have studied the limiting process for um, the, uh, the rare event point process in the case of a simple non uniform hyperbolic dynamical system. The main build map equipped uh, with an absolutely continuous invariant probability measure. Okay, the form for such map that we studied is the one considered um, in uh, liver and social variety and given by this exp expression, okay, for alpha uh, between zero and one. So essentially, we have um, a map in the second branch, we have a line, so to x min minus one. In the first one, we have that in particular, the derivative um, at zero is equal to one. So um, we have proved that for this map, uh, if the point is non-periodic, then we have again um, a convergence to a simple Poisson process. If the point is periodic, then the REPP converges in distribution to a compound Poisson process with intensity theta tau, where theta is given by one minus the backward contraction rate of FP at zeta and multiplicity distribution, so distribution of the size of the cluster, uh, given by the geometric law with parameter theta, okay? So in the limit, the cluster size follows a geometric distribution with parameter theta, whose expected value, we know that it is the inverse of theta. So the usual, um, as usual, the extremal index coincides with the inverse of the mean of the limiting cluster size distribution, in this case, okay? Um, with Miguel Abadi and Josh Freitas, we built a counterexample for this usual interpretation of the extremal index. So the idea was to make a balanced mixture of a behavior associated with an extremal index equal to zero, with the behavior of an extremal index different from zero. Uh, for that, we use precisely the LSV map and assumed that the observable was maximized at two points. So one of them was the indifferent fixed point, zero. And for the other one, we consider two cases, but here uh, I will only present the case where zeta tilt, so second point, at which um, phi achieved the global maximum is a non-periodic point, okay, whose orbit does not eat zeta. And let's see what happens. 
So I will suppose that um, first, that the observable was maximized at a single fixed point zero. And in this case, the extremal index that we obtain is equal to zero. So here we have the level UN, uh, phi, achieving a global maximum at zero. Exceeding the level is equivalent to entering this ball here in red. And now to compute the um, extremal index, we have to do this, uh, the limit of these quotients. In the denominator, we have the measure of the ball. And in the numerator, we have the measure of the annulus. The annulus it, uh, corresponds to the points of the ball that after, P, uh, after one iterate, in this case, because the point is uh, a fixed point, uh, are, are not um, in, in the ball, okay? So, but this, uh, because the derivative at zero is equal to one, the measure for um, U sufficiently, M sufficiently large, measure of this annulus is negligible when compared with the measure of the ball, right? So the, the limit of this quotient is equal to zero. So for this fixed point, the extremal index would be equal to zero. Now we consider the other situation if the observer was, was maximized at a single non-periodic point, zeta tilde, for example, here. So exceeding the level is equivalent to enter the, in this util. But now we observe that since the point is non-periodic for and sufficiently large, the annulus coincide with the ball because there are no points of the ball returning to the ball in a fixed uh, time uh, of each rate. Okay, so theta two in this case is equal to one. Now we mix things, okay, both situations. So here exceeding the level, uh, I'm assuming that phi achieves uh, the maximum at these two points, zeta and zeta till. Exceeding the level is equivalent to entering the union of these two balls. Okay, so in this denominator we have the, we have the sum of the measures. Uh, we suppose to simplify the computations that the measures are equal, for example. And in the, nominator, the numerator we have the measure of the union of the NY. Okay, um, using the arguments that I used before, we, I immediately see that this extremal index is the mean of the previous ones, okay? So is equal to, in this case, particular case, one and a half. And now to finish, we have the result with uh, Miguel Abad and George Freitas um, that says that this process admits, uh, in fact, an extremal index uh, equal to one half. Moreover, the rare event point process converges in distribution to a simple Poisson process with intensity theta tau. So although we have an extremal index strictly uh, um, less than uh, one, we have, in this case, a simple Poisson process. Uh, and in fact, the multiplicity distribution is simply given by pi one is equal to one and pi k equal to zero for k, an integer k uh, larger or equal than two. And so the corresponding mean is equal to one. So we immediately see that this is an example for which theta does not coincide with the inverse of the mean of limiting cluster size distribution because here we have one half and here we have one. Okay. And uh, this happens because of the following. So both points, the point zero and uh, zeta, which is zero, and point zeta two contributes to the uh, final value of the extremal index, okay? Because we have zero plus one divided by two. But the point zero does not contribute to the final multiplicity distribution because the multiplicity distribution is the same as that we would obtain if the observable was um, achieves the, uh, the global maximum at zeta till, okay? Because when we make the computations, we have to weight involve probabilities by the measures of the annuli, okay? And the measure of this one is negligible when compared to this one. So the part corresponding to the first point does not appear at the end, okay? When do the limit, uh, so the mass, um, we have loss of mass. 
So we just obtain this part. And this does not happen to the extremal index, only to the multiplicity distribution. And for that reason, we have uh, that uh, the, um, theta does not coincide with the inverse of the mean of the limiting cluster size distribution. Okay? And I think I can stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Alexander, for this talk. I'm sorry for these technical problems. That sorry, 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 sorry. I think it was my problem. <laughs> no. so are there any questions, comments? If I may, I would like to ask a question about, uh, so in, in this type of uh, problem of uh, extremal index, and uh, you always consider some very specific type of observable, which is built with, uh, so, something looking like the distance to some point. And is it, uh, can you consider more general? Uh, no, it is not very restrictive, okay? okay. I just uh, put uh, that expression because it is very easy to identify the radius, okay? okay. Level in, this, in that case, it is, uh, uh, so entering the ball of radius G minus one of U. But we can uh, consider more general um, observables. Okay? okay, it's not very restrictive. Okay, okay. thank you. Are there any other questions? If any, okay. If any, since we are a bit late, maybe we can jump to the next talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anaxina. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Anna Christina. And uh, so, please, so Julien, can you please stop the screen? sharing of my screen? Can everybody see? Yes, good. Okay. Uh, can everybody hear also? Yeah, so it's full screen now. So, okay, great. So, uh, I'll, so I'll, no, I'll let you. Uh, let me introduce you. So now we will listen to Julien Cidro from University of Sorbonne, Paris. And he will talk about uh, quantum limit theorems for expanding on average for cycles. So please. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Romain. And uh, uh, obrigado aos organizadores. And uh, that was the only Portuguese I knew. So I will, I will speak in English. Uh, as Romain said, I will talk about uh, joint work with Davor Dragicevich from the University of uh, Rijeka in Croatia concerning quench limit theorem for expanding on average co-cycles. So uh, my talk will be divided in four parts. Uh, I will start by reminding a very elementary proof of the classical central limit theorem. And uh, I will try to explain along the talk how this proof is in fact the very essence of what you need to show limit theorem for a more general type of dynamical systems. And through, through generalization to a more and more general type of system, first deterministic dynamics, then a class of random dynamical system. And lastly, I will talk about what we did with Davor, which is generalize, generalize this approach to a very general type of expanding on average cycle. So first, uh, the central limit theorems that we all know and love. Uh, so you take a, a sequence of IID L2 random variables, you look at the partial sum, uh, you scale by square root of n, and in distribution, this goes to some Gaussian, of, which is centered in the way I wrote it, and uh, which, uh, which has variance sigma square. So this is a very classical result, of course. And uh, the proof uh, can uh, be written in three lines, a very simple proof. Uh, so you, you have the first equality by using the ident that uh, the random variables are identically distributed and independent. The second equality you get by Taylor formula for uh, exponential uh, map. And then you let n go to infinity. This is a classical uh, calculus result that this goes to this uh, characteristic function of a Gaussian. And then you can conclude by Levy's continuity theorem. Okay, so of course everybody knows that, and uh, this is uh, when will I start saying uh, more interesting things? Well, 
the idea I would like you to 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 have to to keep is that uh, in fact this is all that we need to show uh, limit theorem for a very complicated type of uh, processes generated by random dynamical systems. So let me explain in more details. So uh, when uh, we look at uh, processes generated by a uh, deterministic dynamical system. Uh, the type of uh, the same type of, uh, of processes that Anna Christina was talking about. You look at some observable and you look at the composition with uh, T n. So T here will be a piecewise C two uniformly expanding map of the interval i. Uh, by uniformly expanding, I mean that it is uh, of course uh, it, the infimum of its derivative. It's bigger than some lambda, bigger than one. So it is well known that this type of system admits. Uh, absolutely continuous invariant probability measure that I denote by mu, uh, whose density is denoted by rho. And uh, for some bounded, over, bounded variation observable, f, that is centered, which means that the integral with respect to mu is zero, then we know that there exists some quantity uh, that is called the diffusion coefficient, uh, such that uh, the Birkhoff sum of f uh, scaled by a square root of n converges to the Gaussian uh, centered and with variance sigma square uh, in distributions, in the sense of distributions. And uh, so this coefficient sigma square here also plays the role of the variance that uh, was in the previous uh, central limit theorem. It has uh, an explicit expression in terms of correlation of the map T that I won't write here to keep things simple and readable. Uh, and so, as I said, the key idea here is that the, when you want to prove this type of result, you can, in fact, use exactly the same steps as you used before. So, the one important tool in this, uh, in this type of approach is given by the transfer operator associated to the map T, which has the following explicit expression for an observable phi that we will consider to be BV, for example. So, what are the ingredients of the proof? You first write the expectation with respect to the invariant measure of the characteristic function of Sn scaled by square root of n, and you remark that it can be expressed as the integral of something that is close to the transfer operator, which is called the twisted transfer operator, uh, whose definition is written uh, here. And uh, so this gives you a, a convenient representation of the, your expectation that will replace the independence and identically distributed assumption previously, of the previous central limit theorem. Now, another key ingredient is the spectral gap of the transfer operator L, by which I mean that you have this decomposition as a sum of a spectral pro, as two spectral projectors, one on the, uh, on the eigenspace generated by the invariant density. And the other one, uh, R, is just here to say that uh, when you have zero average function, the iterates of the transfer operator decays in norm, in BV norm, exponentially fast. So this is what the spectral gap in, and this is a classical property of piecewise C2 uniformly expanding systems. Now, using classical analytic perturbation theory, uh, by remarking that LZ is uh, an analytic perturbation of the original transfer operator L, I can extend this spectral gap property to LZ and conclude that there is a maximal eigenvalue lambda Z that depends analytic, analytically sorry, on Z. So these three ingredients are the same ingredients, allows us to uh, write the same proof as the classical CLT for this uh, situation. So the, we have uh, this conclusion is the those ingredients and this is the same computation as I presented first. So a few comments on this idea. The original idea goes back to Nagaev in the 60s for Markov chains and to Givarch in the 80s for dynamical systems. Uh, I presented a very simple situation here of piecewise, C2, uh, piecewise expanding maps, uh, but you can, uh, show, you can use the same proof for a very general type of system. The important property here is what I call the spectral gap property. Uh, so the, you, you just need a suitable Banach space to, for which this uh, property holds. You can also show a lot of other type of probabilistic limit theorem with these ingredients, like large, large deviations, uh, local central limit theorem, various estimates, almost sure, almost sure invariance principles, etc., etc. So 
Now, uh, I will present the recent work of uh, Dragicevich, uh, Froiland, Gonzalez, Stockman, and Vianti, where they generalize this approach to random dynamical systems. Uh, so the setup uh, is uh, as follows. You take a probability space and you endow it with an invertible measure-preserving ergodic map that you call sigma. Uh, you look at a countably valued measurable family of uh, C2 maps of the circle, for example, or it could be of the interval. And uh, you look at the following quantity. So the number of monoticity branches of T and the uh, essential infimum over X of the derivative. And you assume the following that this essential infimum is bigger than some constant bigger than one, that the number of monoticity branches over the family T omega is uh, bounded, essentially bounded, and some sort of bounded distortion condition. Okay, so this is to say that basically, I compose at random maps that are uniformly expanding, uh, and that satisfies some other boundedness condition. I will form a co-cycle over sigma by looking at the product along the orbit of sigma. And uh, the equivalent of my observable will now be a family, a measurable family of BV observables that are essentially bounded in BV norm. And the equivalent of the Birkhoff sum will be the random Birkhoff sum that I write here. So before I go on to stating theorem and giving uh, hopefully an idea of the proof, I will try to just say what are the equivalents of the, of the spectral properties that play such an important role in the previous proof. Here, we are not looking at uh, iterates of a transfer operator, but at a co-cycle. And so what are the equivalents? What are the, the good properties to, to have to, to write something that makes sense in this setting? So uh, I uh, sum it up in a convenient table. Uh, so on the left, you have what happens for autonomous dynamics, and on the right, what happens for non-autonomous dynamics. So, Instead of looking at iterates of transfer operator Ln, you look at a transfer operator cocycle L omega n that you construct a, as you construct the cocycle T omega n. So you look at product along the sigma orbits. The equivalent of the spectral radius would be played by the what we call the top Lyapunov exponent. The equivalent of the essential spectral radius would be played by something that is called the index of compactness that I won't define here but uh, just know that you have an equivalent of this essential spectral radius, so you can define what it means to be quasi-compact when the index of compactness is strictly smaller than the top Lyapunov exponent. The isolated eigenvalues, so the part of the spectrum that are be, uh, behind, uh, in between the essential spectral radius and the spectral radius, will be called here exceptional Lyapunov spectrum, and the invariant density equation LH to H will be played here by the equivariant density equation. So H omega is sent by is sent by L omega to H sigma omega. Okay, you move fibers, but it's the, it plays the same role. And so uh, if you have this uh, table in mind, hopefully what I will say next will make sense. Now, uh, what is the quenched uh, CLT uh, in this setting? So uh, for the system I described, there exists a measurable family of BV, of, of BV maps, satisfying uh, that they are essentially bounded uh, in the BV norm, that they, they also satisfy this uh, equivariant density equation. I did not wrote it, but there are also positive, uh, non -neg uh, positive map, uh, non-negative maps, sorry, and uh, they have integral one. Now you have this uh, important property uh, that is a decay of correlation property. Okay, so you have uh, you have an exponential de rate, decay rate for the zero average observable of the transfer operator cycle. Now, I would like to attract your attention to the fact that the constant c here is independent on omega. So the, this is a very strong property that holds in the setting I described, but not in not in more general situation. Now, with those ingredients, uh, you can, Dragicevich and uh, others, so Freiland, Gonzalez, Stockman, Bianchi showed in a 2018 paper that uh, there is a quantity, a diffusion coefficient in this setting that is uh, independent of omega. It is an annealed quantity, not a quantity. So that under a centering condition, you have a central limit theorem. You have a convergence in distribution towards this. Uh, a Gaussian of uh, a certain Gaussian of variance of variance sigma squared. So now, what are the 
key ideas uh, in this uh, behind this theorem? Well, it's the same ideas that I showed you before for deterministic dynamics. So you represent the uh, expectation with respect to your equivalent measure of your characteristic function. You represent it as, uh, in, as an integral of some twisted transfer operator cocycle. So uh, now it is the same formula, but for the cocycle, so you look at some weighted transfer operator. You use the uniform in omega decay of correlation property, which will, which will be given by some uniform type quasi compactness for the transfer operator cocycle at omega. Uh, and so you cannot use now uh, the classical uh, Cato type perturbation theory, but you can built using some uh, clever uh, formulation of the, of the implicit function theorem, you can use some form of classic of uh, perturbation theory to conclude that this quasi-compactness uh, transfers to the twisted transfer operator and build a maximal Lyapunov exponent that is analytic in Z in a neighborhood of zero. Now, you will ex exploiting these uh, three ingredients, which are very similar to the ingredients for the deterministic dynamics and which are also very similar to the three steps uh, calculation that the computation that I showed you first, you can uh, you can show the sorry the, the quench limit theorem. Now a few comments on this. Uh, so the first two points of the theorem, uh, the, the first two points theorem that I stated was known since the end of the 80s by a work of Ferro and Schmidt. The central limit theorem is known since Kiefer in the 90s. So what is the point is to show other type of quench limit theorem. So the ingredients I show you when they hold uh, allow you to, to show a, a very large uh, family of quench limit theorem, like large deviation, local CLT, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also you can use that for to cover many type of random system. Uh, so I give I give a few examples here. And what is important is that this uh, this uh, Unif this decay of correlation property holds uniformly, meaning that the constant appearing there does not depend on omega. So, yeah, as I read here, and this is uh, this is all good and well, but this is unfortunately not the most general type of situation. And uh, there are many interesting uh, random system that does not very, uh, satisfy this uh, uniform in omega decay of correlation property. So what do you do? Uh, you uh, uh, let me describe an example where the, there is a, this uh, uniform in omega property does not hold and explain to you what type of result we obtain with Davos. So the setup is the same as before. You have a base uh, space and map. You have a countably valued family of C2 local diffeomorphism on uh, the unit interval that satisfy the following assumption. You have this expanding on average property. So you want that the logarithm of the essentially femum of the derivative over the family is uh, as positive integral. And this replace this uh, uniform bound on the de delta t omega that you had in the, in the previous situation. Now you, you ask that uh, this uh, distortion coefficient uh, is uh, log integrable. Uh, this is another important uh, assumption. And you ask for some random covering so if you take some small subinterval, you want that there is some iterate that uh, is the whole phase space. Now, in this setup, uh, Buzi uh, showed that there is an equivariant family uh, of densities. So uh, that satisfies the first point. And that satisfies, and you also have uh, the non-uniform decay of correlation. So if you have uh, a centered, uh, a zero average inter observable, sorry, there is a positive random variable and some rate that gives you the decay correlation in BV norm. So the question uh, that we asked with Davor was, can we make the previous approach work in this situation? And I would not be here uh, talking about that uh, now if the answer wasn't yes. So what is uh, what was surprising to us was that we obtained what we call the scaling condition that I will explain now. So you, you take a measurable and essentially bounded family of BV observables. So you want them to be centered as, as previously. And now we what we uh, obtain is that there exists a positive random variable K. In fact, it is a tempered random variable. Uh, you also have a diffusion coefficient that now depends on your observable and your 
this random variable k is just for what we call the scaled observable that you obtain by dividing the observable by k, you have the quenched uh, central limit theorem, meaning that this uh, convergence in distribution holds. So uh, this is uh, this is the, re the result we obtained. And uh, so as with the spectral method in general, uh, you can use, uh, once, once you have the ingredients, you can use that to show many type of quench limit theorem. So I uh, wrote the one we obtained uh, in the paper, in the preprint. Uh, we are also working on uh, the absolutely, uh, the uh, almost trend principle. Now, under different condition, uh, CLT was obtained in this setting by Kiefer. So the, he had no scaling condition, but he had other type of restriction on the observable in the system. So I pre, the example I presented to you uh, uh, is a, a sub a sub example of a more general situation with piecewise monotone expanding an average random system, meaning that you allow uh, you allow some, uh, some discontinuity in your maps. Uh, so the scaling constant k is known explicitly via sp by spectral uh, information on the transfer operator cocycle. So we have an explicit expression for it, which is not very pretty, so I won't show it here, but uh, you, you can know uh, this, uh, if you know the, the spectrum of the oscillated spectrum of your transfer cycle, you know K, that's the information I wanted to give. The main tool of the proof, uh, so it, it would be a vague remark, but uh, it, it, the idea is to change the norm uh, uh, from the BV norm to something that depends on omega that is equivalent to the BV norm that will allow the, to absorb the non-uniformity in the decay of correlation. So the, the, the decay of correlation estimate I showed you now hold in this omega norm with the constant one. And with this, uh, once we build this, we can basically use the same proof that I show you for the deterministic dynamics for the classical CLT and for the quench random situation. And uh, finally, I will uh, end uh, this by an open question. Uh, so we tried to show it, but we so far we did not did it. That so with the scaling is a sufficient condition. Is it necessary, or can we find a counter example where it does not work? Uh, we played around with some examples, but did not uh, manage to to show what we wanted. So uh, this is uh, this is the end of my talk, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Julien, for this talk. So are there any questions? So maybe I got one. So it's more of general questions that to prove limit theorems for random quench random dynamical systems, there is a sort of competing method using a complex version of Birkhoff cons and Hilbert Betwick mm -hmm. by uh, Kiefer and Afuta. Yes. So um, I still don't understand how we can compare those two methods if one is better than the other. So maybe uh, you have some in Well, that, that is a good question. So I tried for uh, some time to make the cone, the cone method work here. But um, so the problem is that uh, if in the Afuta and Kiefer situation, basically you need the, the cone convergence to hold for every iterate of the map. You want to choose your, you, you want to choose your system so that every T omega has a transfer operator that contracts the same cone. Or at each step, it contracts the cone, a cone at least. And the problem is that in the busy situation of the piecewise monotone expanding on average random system, this cone contraction does not happen at each step. It happens over very long iterate times, and sometimes it just fails. And you have to re-wait re a long time to obtain a, a cone contraction. And so this... Uh, since you have some iterates that won't be expanding, uh, you have, sorry, some, uh, some T omega won't be expanding in this situation. So it will destroy everything you, you had uh, on your con construction. So you have to, it does not work uh, the same. And which is better? So in my opinion, they are pretty much equivalent in the third setup I showed. So when you look at, uh, you compose uniformly expanding, uh, at random uniformly expanding map, you will obtain the same type of result. And I don't know if it works in the, the fourth setting. Thank you. Uh, I think there was a question by... Uh, yes, please. Yes. I, I talked to, to uh, Matt uh, directly, but please go ahead and, and answer the question. Okay, so the, the question is that in the busy setup, what is the assumption on C omega? 
so if I remember correctly, uh, there are th there is no uh, assumption of temperedness. I, I mean, there is no result of temperedness. And in fact, uh, what I present here as the conclusion of Buzy's theorem is not really the conclusion of Buzy's theorem. Uh, so Buzy's theorem hold not so the uh, the left hand side is not in BV norm, but it infinite in L infinity norm. And the C omega is not uh, tempered, it's just a positive random variable. So, like I wrote, but if you work a little more, in fact, you plug in Bezier's result in the multiplicative ergodic framework, and uh, this is what you will get. Because uh, if, you, if you look at, uh, if you add some more. Uh, Assumption, and uh, this is what I meant by saying that I want a countably valued family. You can apply the multiplicative ergodic uh, theorem to a version of the multiplicative ergodic theorem to this setting. And uh, plugging in Buzi's conclusion, you will get control over the exceptional Lyapunov uh, spectrum. And this is what you will obtain. So, uh, pro properly saying, uh, in Buzi's work, there is no, no assumption on C omega, but you, you can get a little more by uh, working with the multi multiplicative ergodic theorem. I hope this answers at least partially the question. Any other questions? Uh, there is another question. Of my no. But in this, this is, I think, what you have in spot. Oh, okay. Great. So we, uh, if we don't have any other questions, then I suggest we thank uh, Julien again. Hmm. So we can move to the next talk by a while. Thank you, Omar. Please, okay. Please, while can you share your screen? Let me try full screen. Can you see it? Yes. Excellent. It's not full screen, but uh, we still now, see the UI of Adobe. It looks to me full screen on my computer. Is it not on yours? OK, let me stop sharing, and then I'll share again. OK. Okay, it's full screen okay. now. Good. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, go ahead. We will listen to Wai Basu from the yeah. University of Losborough, and he will talk about the map lattices coupled by collisions, chaos per lattice unit. So please. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Romain, for uh, the invitation. Uh, this is a uh, joint work with uh, Juan Shei from uh, Sorbonne also. Um, colleague of uh, Julien. Um, so um, uh, I'm going to start the presentation uh, by showing you a picture, which is uh, not necessarily, uh, well, it's not the model that I'm going to talk about, but gi it gives um, a good way to uh, visualize uh, the model that I'm going to uh, present. Uh, so this is, um, uh, this, this figure here is uh, from a paper by uh, Gaspert and Gilbert in uh, 2008, uh, where uh, they wanted to study a, a large system and they wanted to derive uh, some Fourier law. I'm not going to talk about this stuff, but just uh, um, uh, let me explain to you how the dynamics uh, work in, in this model. So the big gray uh, circles, these are uh, fixed uh, obstacles and um, the um, uh, black circles are, are moving circles. So these are uh, moving uh, balls. So these are the, this is where the dynamics uh, takes place. So uh, if I look uh, at this region here, I can think of this uh, as a site uh, in my uh, big dynamic, large dynamical system where uh, this uh, black ball is uh, moving in between these uh, four uh, obstacles. And uh, what happens is that uh, these uh, black balls, they are uh, um, 
kind of uh, a bit large uh, in a sense that they cannot uh, go uh, between uh, two obstacles, but uh, they are small enough uh, so that they can collide with another ball in uh, a neighboring um, uh, site. Okay. And so when there is no collision uh, between the balls, this is uh, the uh, local site dynamics. And in such a model as the one which is described here, this is uh, billiard dynamics. So this is um, when there is no collision. The local dynamics is described by, uh, of each ball is described by its position and velocity and evolves according to classical billiard dynamics. And when two moving balls uh, collide, all what happens here is that they exchange the components of their velocities that are parallel to the line through their centers at the moment of impact. So uh, one thing also, which I'd like you also to um, uh, keep in mind that of course, uh, each ball cannot uh, collide with more than one neighbor at a time. Okay, so uh, it's exactly the same kind of analogy that we will try to describe in the model uh, that uh, uh, we have in mind. Okay, so uh, how uh, did I come uh, to this stuff? I was reading uh, an article by Lysa Young and uh, this is published in 2013. It's a kind of a, a review article and the title is Understanding Chaotic uh, Dynamical Systems where she suggested that uh, it's interesting to meaningfully um, uh, quantify chaos per unit volume in large systems. So let me uh, say roughly what she talked about. So she talked about, for example, um, if you have a coupled system, if, uh, take a finite uh, approximation of this and look, for example, at entropy, see how entropy scales uh, with the size uh, of the system and then uh, try to, if, if you see the scaling, try to um, uh, normalize by the scaling and see if the limit exists as, as the size of the system goes to infinity. Um, another uh, uh, objects are the same, you know, diffusion, for example, and uh, you can look at uh, coupled uh, systems, which are like uh, open systems with, with holes. And she referred to, uh, to articles where they study uh, one-dimensional uh, lattices uh, where they obtain some kind of scaling and they have some um, uh, limits uh, exist. But this is all what they have, but they don't have any, um, uh, any precise uh, formula. Um, so uh, this sounded uh, interesting to me and I thought with uh, the help of transfer operators, uh, I'm sure we can do uh, a bit more, you know, much better than, than this in the sense that one hopefully can derive uh, precise uh, formulas. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to study a discrete time coupled system analogous to the uh, gaspard gilbert uh, model. And uh, this discrete time model uh, that I'm going to uh, describe in, in, in a minute, it was introduced by Keller and Lebrani in uh, 2009. Uh, what they did there, they studied an infinite, uh, uh, an infinite, infinite couple system. And what they proved, they proved the existence uh, of um, uh, a, a unique uh, physical measure in a subclass uh, of measures and they proved um, exponential uh, decay of correlation. Of course, in, in, in their setting, they don't have uh, the usual spectral stock where uh, you cannot get uh, with their techniques, uh, spectral gap and, and uh, so on. So this is what they did. And uh, what we want to do with their model, we want to um, uh, uh, study things in the line of uh, uh, in the line that Leslie Young described in her paper, we want to uh, uh, quantify orbits under the dynamics that do not see collision up to time n in a finite dimensional lattice first. 
uh, we want to check uh, how uh, this quantity scales in L, and then we want to derive uh, a precise explicit formula for the first collision rate per lattice unit in the infinite dimensional system. Okay, so uh, let me uh, start uh, now the technical stuff. So uh, I here will denote the uh, closed uh, unit interval and uh, X will be um, uh, uh, copies uh, of I. So I, I take um, uh, lambda copies of I and this could be infinite or it could be uh, finite. And uh, I'm going to denote by ML the L-dimensional uh, Lebesgue uh, measure. And the uh, local dynamics uh, in my, this is the uncoupled system, so I have many uh, cells and uh, on each cell I have some local dynamics and the local dynamics uh, is described by a, a piecewise onto expanding a C1 plus alpha map. Of course, um, uh, one of the things uh, which, uh, you know, if I go back to the Gilbert uh, Gaspert model, uh, the dynamics there is, um, uh, is um, given by uh, um, billiard uh, dynamics. But uh, so far, uh, this transfer operator techniques uh, for billiards in dimension uh, higher than, than two, they are not. Uh, available yet. So uh, we're happy with uh, piecewise expanding maps uh, at the moment. Okay, so uh, still for the uncoupled uh, dynamics, uh, then we define just uh, the uh, product map from X to X, and which uh, tells you that, uh, well, uh, uh, the uh, piece component of this product map is just uh, the local dynamics at site P. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to start uh, introducing uh, the uh, couple dynamics. I'm going to denote by V star, the standard uh, basis of RD. So here I want to um, uh, label uh, uh, collision zones by, by uh, elements uh, of, of uh, this set. Um, and uh, so V will be the union of V plus minus V plus. And the collision zones uh, will be denoted by uh, A sub epsilon minus V. And, and uh, these are disjoint open intervals and they are all of size epsilon. Okay, so just imagine uh, the picture there um, for each uh, for each side, you have, um, because you are in two dimension, you have uh, four collision zones. There are, and there are disjoint. Yeah, in, here we are talking about intervals. They are disjoint and they are all of size epsilon, okay? And uh, the coupling, uh, it looks uh, like this. So this is the formula. Um, as I described in the picture there, if, um, if I have uh, two nearby uh, neighbors at the same time in the collision, in the corresponding collision zones, what happens? They simply exchange coordinates and otherwise I just apply the local dynamics. Yeah, it's the same uh, coordinate. One thing which is uh, particular about uh, this coupling here, unlike uh, uh, many um, uh, papers on, on coupled uh, systems, uh, this coupling here is discontinuous. Yeah, it creates discontinuity uh, and it makes uh, the coupled system discontinuous uh, by a definition. Okay. Um, and then we define the coupled dynamics as usual. Uh, it's denoted by T epsilon from X to X, and it's given by the composition. So you apply the product map, and then uh, you compose this with the coupling that I described above. Good. 
So what do we want to do now? We want to uh, define these sets of points that do not see a collision up to time n. So I start uh, with a site uh, P in my, in my set. And uh, this will be denoted by x sub epsilon d of p. So this is uh, the set of points that uh, at site p they don't see uh, they they don't see a collision with uh, with the um, neighbor uh, in the direction v. And if I take the intersection uh, over all point in my lattice and intersection um, over uh, all uh, uh, directions, uh, then I get uh, the set uh, that uh, do not see uh, collision uh, at, time, uh, at time one. Uh, and then I can define by iteration in the usual way uh, the set of points that do not see a collision up to time n. So this is just the inter intersection of the pre-images under the product map. Well, it's the same thing here, whether you use the coupling, the couple map or, or the uh, product map. On this set, they are the same. Um, and this is how I define the set of points that do not see a collision up to time n. The complement of the set x zero epsilon with, uh, you know, in, in, in x, it will be denoted by h epsilon. Of course, if you are familiar with the uh, maps with holes, this is a, a very similar uh, situation, what I'm, I'm talking about. Or if you uh, study, uh, you know, uh, return time statistics, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same. Uh, kind of setup. And uh, I'm going to introduce the following definition, which is again motivated by the definition of uh, escape rates. Uh, so if I suppose that the following uh, limit exists, so uh, directly I'm defining this with respect to Lebesgue measure, then I call such a quantity the first collision under T epsilon with respect to Lebesgue measure. Okay. And uh, what do we prove? Okay, so uh, we prove uh, that uh, this limit uh, exists. And, um, and in fact, it has the following uh, first order uh, uh, approximation. So it's equal to mu zero of h epsilon times this constant theta, which I'm going to illustrate uh, at the end of the talk times uh, one plus little o of one. So this is the first order approximation uh, of this first collision rate. Now I'd like to see how it scales in L. Okay, so what is mu zero? Mu zero is the absolutely continuous invariant measure of the product map. So this is just the product measure uh, of, of uh, the, it's the product of the absolutely continuous invariant measures at local sites, okay? And what we can prove, we can prove that this, the, uh, this absolutely continuous invariant measure of H epsilon, it scales uh, in L in the following way, as L times epsilon square goes to zero. Here, epsilon square, because uh, remember when we are talking about uh, collision uh, zones, each, co each collision zone is of, of size epsilon, and this is, where the epsilon square uh, appears from. Okay, so good. And uh, what is this uh, psi epsilon here? Well, this psi epsilon uh, is uh, the following formula, which depends on the invariant density at a uh, local site. This is, uh, you know, integrated at these uh, collision uh, zones. Okay, so now things uh, are, uh, um, kind of uh, obvious how you should normalize and how you should uh, take uh, the limits. Simply, uh, I'm going to normalize by one over L. And if I take the limit as L epsilon squared goes to zero, I obtain uh, the following formula for the collision rate per lattice uh, unit where psi epsilon and theta are uh, the same as uh, theorem uh, 
uh, one. And um, to uh, finish uh, my presentation, I'm going to uh, illustrate uh, uh, the formula of theta. The formula of theta, if you take a one-dimensional lattice, it's very simple. It's similar to what we see in one-dimensional dynamics. So you get the following formula in the periodic case. So in the, uh, if you don't have periodic uh, points, uh, theta is simply one as usual. But uh, if you have, uh, say, this is in the periodic case, uh, this is the formula of uh, theta. However, once you take a lattice of dimension two and bigger, then the formula starts to get uh, very complicated, which I'm not going to um, um, define all these uh, quantities uh, and terms here. So if you are interested, have a look at, at the uh, preprint on archive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Well, Thank you. So as we are already very late, so I suggest that unless there are very short questions, maybe. Uh, just a, a short question, if I may. Uh, so the, the formula well that you wrote in uh, in the CRM one for gamma L, it reminds me of uh, the the formula that Keller obtains for uh, the the dominating eigenvalue with this uh, rare event Perron Frobenius operator. Is this the same type of tools you use? Yes, it's the same type uh, of tools. Indeed, that's why I said the transfer operators. So in finite dimension, you can uh, get a spectral gap. And, and an eigenvalue, and you do a first order approximation for the uh, eigenvalue, and you want to see in, in, in uh, such setting, you want to see how it scales also with L. Okay, so... Uh, so you have the second formula. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, Ryan. Thanks. So I think we can move to the last talk of this morning by Mark. Okay. Can you please share? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So everything is good. So for the last talk of today, we will listen to Mark Pulicot from the University of Warwick, who will talk about Osdorf dimension and the Lagrange Markov spectrum. So please, Mark. Thank you very much. Do you have a preferred time when I stop? <laughs> uh, in principle, this session is supposed to end at 15 before noon. But I don't know if we have some okay don't worry more time a lot after uh, until noon so i would say you can talk up during 40 minutes as as a, a schedule 40 minutes for the talk and then we will see about question if we have, we have time questions unfortunately i mean it's called okay fair enough um so let me begin by uh just saying that uh, it's a pleasure to be giving a talk and uh Mia Karasal is sempre en porta. Agora mia spouse está en porta. Mi spero que ela vai cod regressa para Inglaterra. Um, so I want to talk about uh, something that's very simple, um, at least to explain, not so easy to actually prove. Um, and uh, it's connected, it's at the interface between number theory and dynamics. So you can think of it as an application of ideas from dynamical systems to problems in uh, number theory. And so I have a number of uh, illustrious co-authors, uh, Matthias Moreira and um, uh, Litnova, all listed in their, in their pomp. It's a good thing. And as I said, what I want to do is to talk about how sometimes you can use dynamical ideas um, to solve problems in different areas, for example, in analysis and, and number theory. And this is an instance of such a thing. And let me begin by maybe asking the question, what sort of questions might we want to uh, consider? And so um, in particular, let's, let's look at a problem in number theory. And so I think in particular, um, this will be connected with something that's quite familiar. It's to do with Diophantine approximation. 
And so I'll talk a little about that on the next slide. But the setting is that the number theory is something that's not quite so scary as one might uh, worry about. It's just very straightforward things. And um, the idea is that the problems you want to study in this context are also not so scary. They're related just to the size of sets, sets that are generated by these problems in number theory. And so we're interested in the size, that is the Hausdorff dimension of these sets. So if I was an analyst, which I'm not really, or a number theorist, which I'm not really, then I might be a bit worried by this. Um, but fortunately, these problems on the size of sets arising in the problems in number theory uh, can actually be formulated in a very simple dynamical way. And so it boils down to just understanding um, the, the dimension of certain sets, which are basically just the repelling Cantor sets under some transformation. So there's basically an underlying dynamical system, which is very, very simple. And for these dynamical systems, you're interested in the invariant set and its size. And it's, this is what you're actually estimating. And this is converted into uh, understanding these problems in number theory. So the dynamics is the, uh, the engine that runs this, uh, this program. And the application is just via some rather, rather nice uh, applications of analysis to, to number theory. Um, okay, and the dynamical methods, well, if you have a Cantor set, uh, then you might want to, to, which is dynamically defined, and you want to work out its uh, dimension, then there are various ways you can do it. But if you are somebody who works a lot in hyperbolic dynamics, then the thing you might reach for is going to be something like the Bowen dimension formula which in fact is what's used in this case, basically. So you, you, you estimate um, the dimension of these invariant sets using uh, simply the standard ideas, pressure, transfer operators, that kind of stuff. And then it trickles down to applications to these problems in, in number theory. So the strategy is very simple and the machinery that one uses to work out the dimension of sets is also fairly standard and, and straightforward although it, there are some, some tweaks in the application to get the results that you want, which I'll talk about a bit later. Okay, so I'll explain almost everything except the details. Uh, and it's, the good news is that all the ideas are very easy. Maybe the computations are a bit messy, but I always skip the hard stuff. So I'll stick with just the easy, easy stuff. Okay, so let me, let me do the number theory bit first. And so despite the scary uh, reference to number theory, uh, the number theory is very easy. And uh, everybody, perhaps everybody, at least my favorite result in um, number theory is just Diophantine approximation. So if you're given uh, any irrational number, which I'll denote by alpha, and for the moment I'll just assume alpha is between zero and one, then of course you can get um, rationals P over Q, such that the difference between alpha and the rational is smaller than uh, one over the denominator squared. So this is just Dirichlet's theorem from 1840-ish. Uh, 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 so Dirichlet was actually married to Mendelssohn's uh, sister, Mendelssohn the composer. Whether he could actually compose or not, I do not know. Maybe his wife could. Uh, so this is a, a result. And so a natural question to ask is, how can this result be uh, improved? So one way in which you might try to improve it would be to replace the two by a bigger number, like two plus epsilon, but let's not do that. Another way to try to improve this result would be to, to replace one over q squared by something smaller. We multiply it by some constant smaller than one. And so this leads to uh, Horowitz's theorem, which is from 1891 which says pretty much the same as Dirichlet's theorem, except it has this improved bound, which says that not only can you find an awful lot of rationals P over Q, which are close to alpha, but they, in fact, slightly closer by a factor of uh, one over square root of five than just the estimate one over Q squared. So this is uh, Horowitz's uh, theorem, which is a, a marginal improvement on on Dirichlet's theorem. So they're all about approximating irrational numbers by uh, rational numbers. So this is a nice classical approach to these things. So the original proof of uh, Dirichlet 
uh, used the pigeonhole principle. It was the first uh, application of it. But an alternative approach is to use continued fractions. So let me just mention something about continued fractions. It's not that relevant, but uh, it gives me something to do on, on this slide. So if we have a, a irrational number, which was once called alpha, but now seems to be called x, um, then you can write it down as an infinite continued fraction if it's irrational. So here we'd write it down as this infinite continued fraction where <clears throat> k1, k2, and k3 are just going to be natural numbers. So the golden mean, for example, maybe it's one over the golden mean, you take all the digits just to be equal to one. That's a standard example. But any irrational number you can write down as uh, an infinite continued fraction of this form, and it's traditional to denote it in the following way, with square brackets, just keeping track of these natural numbers. So if we're given an irrational number called um, x, uh, and we want to approximate it by rationals, one way will be to write down the infinite expansion and then just truncate it at some stage. We get bored maybe by the nth step, and this will give us an approximation, this rational number, when you unfurl the the various uh, numerators and denominators inside here, it'll give you an approximation to x. Very easy. And it's very easy because I looked it up in, in uh, the book of Hardy and Wright, um, that the difference between the irrational given by the infinite continued fraction and this approximation given by truncating the series is bounded by something very simple, which is less than the denominator uh, squared. So this gives you a very simple proof of Dirichlet's uh, theorem. Okay, so we can forget all that. All, is, all I'm saying is that you can approximate irrationals by rationals, and there is some interest in whether you can, you can improve on this, uh, this particular inequality. Okay, so more generally, how can we improve on these two theorems? Well, in fact, the result of Horowitz is sharp in the sense that there is an irrational number for which you can't do better. You can't find infinitely many um, rationals approximating it, which are closer than one over root five, one over q squared. So one has to ask, well, what can one do? Well, if you change the irrational, we throw out uh, a bunch of irrational numbers, then maybe we can do better. So if you take an individual irrational number, which has gone back to being called alpha apparently, so it's just an irrational number in the unit interval, we can say, well, let's choose um, the best value we can uh, for this constant, which I've denoted by C of alpha, such that the irrational alpha is approximated infinitely often by a rational P over Q, where I put now one over Q squared, but multiplied by one over C of alpha. It's one over C of alpha because I want these numbers to get bigger rather than smaller. So in the case that, um, there's a formula for it. And for example, if I took the golden mean or maybe one over the golden mean, then in that case, the best value you can manage is going to be root five. So this shows us that Horowitz's theorem was uh, sharp. And it transpires that there are um, a sequence, a countable sequence of uh, irrational values alpha for which one can write down very easily uh, these uh, kinds of expressions. So basically, we're improving on the, the standard Dirichlet or Horowitz inequality for infinite solutions to this by slipping in a constant, the best constant C of alpha we can get, that is the biggest value, and that gives us a number C of alpha associated to the irrational alpha. So therefore, the aforementioned uh, Lagrange uh, spectrum is just all the values that you can get when you take the union of these values. So we take all possible irrational values, possibly in the unit interval, perhaps even bigger. And then we look at this sequence of values C of alpha, which are getting bigger. And we take the union of all of these, and this is called the Lagrange spectrum. So for every rational number, we have a value C of alpha, we throw it into this bag. And this collection of sets is called the Lagrange spectrum. Is it the spectrum of anything in particular? I don't know, it's just called the Lagrange uh, spectrum. And this is a, a picture of Lagrange, who of course did not define the Lagrange spectrum. It was actually defined by Markov some years later, maybe a century later. 
Okay, so that's for definition. It's going to be a subset of the uh, real line, in fact, the positive reals. And it's just a collection of values associated to different irrational values. So it's a subset of the real line. What can we say about it? Well, the thing we can say is that it's kind of complicated. Uh, so we already spotted that uh, root five was in there because that corresponded to um, alpha uh, for the, the um, golden mean. But there are other values, uh, other special um, algebraic numbers uh, with the property that they give you very specific values for C of alpha. So for example, you get root five, you get root of eight, root 221 over five. And in fact, there's a countable sequence of these points that can occur in the defin definition of the Lagrange spectrum. And this countable family uh, occurs below the value three. So the spectrum itself, it's a subset of the real line. It comes from these better Diophantine approximations. First observation is that it's a countable set when you restrict to the, the range up to three. That's one observation. Uh, another observation is that it's got gaps in it in various places. And it's complicated because, for example, near three, it's kind of a much fatter set. Um, and um, if you go far enough to the right, um, then what happens is that you can get any value for C of alpha. So any value up here, there's gonna be some irrational number for which C of alpha is that value. So the Lagrange spectrum is simply defined in terms of these better approximations, Diophantine approximations, but as a subset of the real line, it's kind of complicated. Below, uh, below three, it's not so bad. Above uh, root 21, or in fact, a value slightly bigger than that, it's not so bad, it's the interval. But between three and say root 21, it's, it's kind of complicated. It's not really well understood. And so the idea is that we're going to understand it better. And the way we're going to do that is to throw some ideas from dynamical systems at it. Seems like a good strategy. Uh, and so the basic question is, what can we say about the complicated spectrum between this value root three and uh, square root of 21, where it looks more complicated? And the good news is that we're going to look at it using Hausdorff dimension. So if you want to say a set is complicated, well, below three, it's countable, so its household dimension is zero. Above root 21, it's an interval, so its household dimension is equal to one. And so somewhere in between, its household dimension is going to vary a bit between these different ranges. So we want to understand how complicated this set is using uh, basically ideas on household dimension. Uh, so there is a definition of household dimension, but I suspect everybody knows the definition of household dimension. Or if you've forgotten it, then me telling you it again will be just confusing. So let me skip it. Here's a, a sort of subliminal picture of what, what the definition is. But let me move on from that. And the question is, well, where, where does the, the set have more Hausdorff dimension? And... Um, as I've already observed, below three, it's countable, so it's got zero dimension. If, it's, if you go far enough to the right, you get an interval. So therefore, the spectrum is going to be, um, it's going to be a hazard dimension one, because it's a set of positive uh, measure. And um, in between, well, you can take a line, you can take a value of t, and you can let it increase. So and you can look at how much of the set between, say, three and um, t, um, has a certain dimension. So you take the intersection of the Lagrange spectra, the complicated bit of it, between three and some value t, which is bigger than three, and you can ask, well, what's the Hausdorff dimension of that set? And uh, Moreira showed that uh, this is continuous. So as you move your cursor to the right and you look at the intersection of this increasing interval with the Lagrange spectrum, a, spe a set about which we know almost nothing at the moment, um, we can say at least that the Hausdorff dimension is, is continuous. And of course, it's monotone increasing because the set's getting bigger. So you can ask questions about, about this. And a natural question to ask is, well, when does this, um, when does this portion of the, the, the spectrum get sufficiently big that it's very fat? 
very fat in this sense would mean that it has Hausdorff dimension uh, equal to one. So that's the question that we want to ask us. The first question we want to ask, that may be the only question that we're going to, to ask, but let me just say that's what we're going to ask. So here is a sort of a picture. So the red line is meant to be the Hausdorff dimension of the intersection uh, given here. So it's the complicated set inter intersected with the interval up to T. So I'm letting T scale off to the right. So as, as, as T starts to three, the Hausdorff dimension is still zero. Um, if, if T is sufficiently large, if, we, if it's equal to root uh, 12, for example, um, then it can be shown that the Hausdorff dimension is equal to one. And uh, the result of uh, Gugu tells us that between three and root 12, where it takes values zero and one, well, in fact, it has to be a continuous. So there's going to be some curve up here. And then the question is, well, when exactly does this, this curve hit the value one? So what's the first time that you can find a, a, a parameter so that the interval from three up to T intersected with this uh, complicated looking set um, actually has Hausdorff dimension equal to one. And that's the question which one can ask. One of many questions that one can ask, and that's the question that we're going to ask uh, here. So quick summary, we're looking at Diophantine approximation. H how good the Diophantine approximation is gives you a subset of the real line. We want to know um, how big the set is. The way we do it is we start at uh, say three or something, and then we look at an interval from three up to T, we intersect it with the set and we, we look at the dimension of that. And we want to know when this dimension gets big enough that it's equal to one. And that's the picture in the bottom right hand corner. Okay, and um, here is the, the uh, probably the definition again of what we want to do. And there were some known sort of heuristic bounds. Uh, so there was a bound due to, to the wonderfully named uh, Bumby, uh, who showed that this value of T0 actually should lie in some particular interval. Uh, and he had a heuristic argument, which means it was non-rigorous. And as you can see, it's to um, three uh, significant figures, maybe four significant figures, three decimal places. And um, we wanted to convert this into a, a rigorous, uh, stronger estimate. And what we did was uh, the following. We showed that in fact, if you look at the interval between three and the value given by T zero, which is given by this thing to as many decimal places as written down, possibly six, um, then this gives you a, a the first time that this set is so complicated that its Hausdorff dimension is equal to one. And this is a numerical value, which is accurate to the uh, six decimal places to which it's given. So we have Diophantine approximation, we have a set, we're trying to say how complicated it is. As you move to the right, um, Gugu's theorem tells us that the set's getting bigger in dimension, or at least changes continuously in dimension, so it's monotone increasing. And we want to find the first time that it has Hausdorff dimension equal to one, and that's it. It's when you get as far as the value T0 given by this particular value. And as I said at the beginning, the, the, the proof is just based on computing the uh, dimension of uh, limit sets of certain iterative function schemes. So just contractions uh, in, the, uh, in the interval given in a very simple sort of a way. So let me move on hopefully to the dynamics. Let me just check what numbering I have on the slides. Excuse me, Ma. I think there is Olga Lima who wants to ask a question, so. Uh, in, in what, what, what? He's what, raising what, his hands using the software. Oh, so does he want to speak? That's also possible. I don't know. How to... Maybe you can use the question and answer. Or telepathy, that might be. I mean, can they unmute themselves or not? 
I doubt it. It's, a, it's in the list of spectators. I, think it's, I suspect these people are muted, but if it's, if, are they able to write in the chat or are they able to raise their hand and, and, and question and answer? I think they can write in the chat. Yes, okay. this is what I'm suggesting to write the question. Chat. Okay, I can I can see the chat. Yeah, I can't see anything written there. Yeah, uh, maybe it's by mistake. I think you should go ahead. Yeah, I okay. can do that. It might be it might be a mistake. No, that that was what I say. Yeah. So That's I'm sorry. Right. Let's continue the talk. Okay. Please. So so we we've 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 formulated the question. It's a question about sets which appear in number theory. And we have also um, formulated the kind of problem. We want to understand their, di di their uh, dimension, their Hausdorff dimension. But we can forget all that now because we're on safer ground. I just want to talk about um, iterated function schemes, simple dynamical systems, and how to compute the uh, dimension of these things. Um, so let's talk about a very simple um, iterated function scheme. So I take the unit interval, 0, 1, and I define two maps. They're basically contractions, give or take. And so they're written uh, here as T1 is just X goes to one over one plus X and T2 is X goes to one over two plus X. What could be easier? So it's a very simple transformation. And here's a picture for those of you that like pictures of unit interval, there's two copies of it. And so uh, T1 is probably going to do something like that. It takes the unit interval and it squashes it down to the interval one half one and the second map takes the unit interval and it squashes it down to the interval one third one half and it also switches the orientation but we don't really care about that and so it's a simple way to to define some dynamics and then the limit set would be well it's a cantor set given by all limit points of images so if you take zero or any point you like and you just keep applying randomly one of these two transformations and take the limit of these, which will exist because they contract, then the cancel set that you get from all possible sequences, well, that will give us the limit set for this thing. So it's like the old familiar middle third cancel set. If you were looking at X goes to X over three and X goes to X over three plus two thirds, then what you get is a middle third cancel set. What you get here is a kind of non-linear cancel set but it's the same basic uh, philosophy. And what we'd like to do is to try to understand the dimension of these sets because it's relevant to the problem of the dimension of a set I've already described. That's the game. And of course, the classical approach to estimating the Hausdorff dimension of such limit sets is to use uh, the pressure function, a bit of thermodynamics in there. So by way of notation, imagine that we have some finite word of ones and twos, and I'll write the length as being equal to n. So these are just, so there'll be two to the n words of length n of this form. And then what we can do is we can associate to this word another contraction of the unit interval, just given by the finite composition of the words associated, uh, of the uh, contractions associated to that word. So I have a word of length n, each of these is an index one or two, so I write down a, a contraction associated to the word by the composition of the contractions associated to each of these two indices. So now I've got two to the n maps contracting the, the uh, interval. And then the pressure function, which we all know and love, but maybe don't always write it like this, uh, we can just say is equal to the limit as n tends to infinity, one over n, the log of something, so you may be counting periodic orbits, you may be looking at um, uh, n epsilon separated sets or something like that. But here we're not, we're just looking at these words. We're looking at the uh, image of zero under this particular contraction and looking at the derivative. And then as a function, we put T in the exponent and it gives us a map from uh, the real line to the real line. So, if you know pressure, you're in great shape. It's what you think it is. Um, if you're not so sure, sure, it's just a function. And the connection with dimension for the previous example and for related examples is that you can read it off from the plot of this graph. So here is P of T, as T increases, this is the definition. Um, as T increases, P of T decreases. And what happens is that it cuts the axis um, here at the value given by the dimension. 
So you can read off the dimension from the pressure function, which is defined by the uh, dynamics. And the fact that the uh, dimension occurs here was a result which kind of was proved by Bowen, but in fact, in a special case of quasi circles to do with Kleinian groups, and then was generalized by Ruel um, to uh, the more general setting, including this, although in fact, Ruel's proof doesn't actually work, but you can fix it and uh, Zinnmeister has a, a nice account of the, the proof. Okay, so this is um, how it goes. So if you want to know the dimension of a set, if the set happens to be given by an iterated uh, function scheme um, of a simple form, then you can always work it out from the pressure. And so for the example I gave before, we had two contractions, x goes to one over one plus x, and x goes to one over two plus x. And you can work out the Hausdorff dimension to whatever level of accuracy you have the patience to do or your computer has the memory to do. So to 200 decimal places, the household dimension of that limit set is given by this value, I claim. And in the proof of the theorem uh, I stated before, involving my illustrious co-authors, um, the key there is that rather than looking at just this very simple dynamical, uh, this iterative function scheme with just two branches, you actually want to impose some Markov condition. And the Markov condition is to try to control uh, the, the, the uh, Lagrange spectrum. So it's, it's a variant on this, but it's very straightforward. Okay, and so um, the way to actually try to get information on the dimension out of the pressure is actually to use the, the transfer operator, which fortuitously we've seen already uh, this morning. So let's go back to the situation that we have these two contractions, T1 and T2, and they contract on the uh, unit uh, interval. Uh, then we can define an operator, in fact, a family of operators, and uh, they're parameterized by T. This was the same thing which uh, was used before in defining the pressure, it's the same parameter. And the transfer operators are going to give us maps from continuous functions to continuous functions. In fact, they'll be even more regular than that, but that will do for the moment. And it works by the usual way. We take a function which is defined on the unit interval called f, and then we get a new, a new function by simply applying the contractions that come from the, the maps at the top and looking at the value of the function at these two values. And then we weight it according to the derivatives of the two contractions raised to the power t. So this is the standard transfer operator that one would associate uh, to just contraction, contracting maps. You could also think of the set lambda as being a repeller where the transformation on the, rep on the repeller would be just a Gauss map restricted to that set. And this would just be the inverse branches for that. But anyway, the transfer operator makes an appearance. And then the connection between the transfer operator and the pressure is also fairly classical. So this uh, operator acting on continuous functions, well, it's a bounded linear operator. It has a spectral radius. And the spectral radius uh, is given by exponential pressure of T. So the spectral radius of this operator, this bounded linear operator defined above for a particular value of T has a largest eigenvalue of spectral radius, um, which is E to the P of T. So P of T is the thing that's gonna give us the dimension. And so in particular, combining it um, with the uh, bowen ruel formula, which required us to have pressure of T to be equal to zero, to be able to spot that T was the dimension. Well, if you just recast it in terms of this uh, lemma of Ruel, used to be a theorem in days gone by, um, then you can see that in fact, um, looking for the dimension is the same as finding a value T for which this operator has got one uh, as its spectral radius, as its maximal eigenvalue. So simple problem, we wanna find the dimension of this limit set because it's useful for the previous problem. How do we do that? Well, we introduce this operator, which is, defi which is defined in terms of the branches, which give you the, uh, the limit set. And then from the operator, we can read it off. So we've reduced the problem to understanding the, the largest eigenvalue for a bunch of, of, of operators. Uh, which sounds better, but in fact, it's not yet ideal because one still has to solve the problem. You have to find a value T for which 
one is the largest eigenvalue when you plug it into this particular operator. And so the way to do that is uh, actually as follows. So there are lots of ways, of course, to understand the spectrum of a transfer operator. You can use kind of ULAM type methods, or you can use various truncation methods, which ULAM methods is sort of one of them, or finite section methods, or you can use periodic points, or alternatively, you can do something else. Uh, and we're gonna do the something else and so what we're gonna do is the following. Um, let's assume that we have two values, T0 and T1, and I want to choose these so that they're actually going to sandwich, they're gonna be upper and lower bounds on the value I'm looking for, the dimension of this limit set. And so given these guys, let me assume that I can find a polynomial, actually a positive polynomial, with the property that if I apply the transfer operator with the lower value T0, um, to the function f, which I'm assuming exists, and I divide it out by f, so it's kind of helpful if it's strictly positive at this stage, so it's not infinite, uh, and I assume that this ratio is bigger than 1, as I vary over the interval, uh, then I want then, if this is, is true, then it will imply that the pressure of t0 is bigger than 0. This is just a, a claim. And a second thing is that if we find another positive uh, polynomial, so that when we apply the operator with this other value called t1, and this new function, which is also positive, divided by the previous function g of x, so it's, the, it's what happens to this function when I apply the operator. So if this thing is always smaller than one in the ratio, then this will imply that the pressure, the, the pressure value of t1 up here is gonna be smaller than zero. So now we have a way to to say that the pressure is bigger than zero or smaller than zero, providing we can cook up functions f and g with some particular property. And this transpires to be rather easy to do in general in this particular example. So here is a sort of picture for those of you that prefer pictures. So in the first case, I've, I've got a function f, it's a polynomial. I've applied the, um, the transfer operator with the weight t, with the value t zero, and it's gone up. The function's got bigger. And in the second picture, I found another polynomial and for the value T1 for the operator, I've applied the operator to this function G and it's gone down. And that's what these equations mean. So if I can find functions F and G so that this happens, uh, then these values of T0 and T1 are going to be relevant to, to, to the dimension. Uh, so in particular, what will happen is that the dimension of a set will lie uh, strictly between the values t0 and t1. And so that's, that's basically the method that is used. So according to my clock, it is 11.52. And I think that I am... I think we still have seven minutes. Well, we have seven minutes, but I'm sure... If, if people... Maybe we can save some time for questions, but it's a wise... Uh... Well, let, let me, let me, I, I, I think it would not be helpful for me to rush too much through other things, but let me, let me just say what's on the next slides anyway. Um, so the, the rest of the slides are related to replacing the Lagrange spectrum with something called the Markov spectrum. So, so the Lagrange spectrum is some subset of the real line defined by Diophantine approximation. And uh, the Markov spectrum is another subset of the real line uh, which is defined uh, in terms of uh, quadratic forms. And the point is that these two sets look very, very, very similar. Um, in fact, they, they, uh, the difference between them is extremely small. Uh, so without laboring the definition, there's a picture of Perron, if you like a picture of Perron. Uh, it's lived to be a ripe old age, so probably number theorists have healthy lives probably. Uh, but the point is there is another set. And a second result we have is to show that the difference between these two sets is very small. So the subsets of the real line, the difference actually has zero measure. Um, but in fact, the Hausdorff dimension of the difference can also be shown to be relatively well controlled. And here are some bounds, which I should say that there were previous excellent bounds by uh, the first two uh, authors, Mateus and Moreira. And in fact, the only improvement here is a bit more number crunching to get the uh, to get these particular uh, values. And so let me, 
uh, maybe just leave it on the summary. So uh, the, first, the, first, the first point was that that should be an L here, not an M, that's a good point. So the first application was just to say that this is the Lagrange spectrum, which I was talking about before. We can say something about when the dimension um, takes the value uh, one, when we intersect on an interval between three and the value, in this case, T1. And secondly, that we can describe the, the difference of the dimension of two sets. But the real thing here is that all of the ideas involved in it are basically dynamical. I mean, the, the idea is that we're characterizing these sets using continued fractions, which are kind of almost dynamical. And then secondly, we're using um, techniques to, to estimate the Hausdorff dimension of these sets. And that's more or less just based on um, standard kind of thermodynamic ideas perhaps a slightly different variant on them, but it's using the same sort of ideas, which I guess that we're all very uh, familiar with. And so let me just thank you, and that's the end. Thank you very much for your last talk, Mark. So do we have any questions? So we have five minutes for questions. So are the questions restricted only to panelists or? Does the greater world have a chance to ask questions? Okay. So I have one question. Uh, oh, okay. It's about the spectrum, the Lagrange spectrum between zero and three. So it's a countable set. It so is. do we have more information about those values, like explicit formulas or an asymptotic expansion? On there, how there, they are accumulate? There, there are explicit uh, formulas. They're, they're actually given by numbers related to what are called Markov triples. Uh, so uh, number theorists uh, have, have kind of nice expressions for them in terms of triples of numbers. Um, and they also have a nice geometric interpretation in terms of geodesics on, on the modular surface. Um, so uh, an alternative viewpoint to Diophantine approximation, an alternative dynamical viewpoint, is to talk about geodesics and geodesic excursions into the cusp. And so there's a kind of nice interpretation in that context for, this, for the, low, the lower values of C of alpha in terms of bounding how far uh, orbits to the geodesic flow, that is geodesics on the modular surface can go up the cusp. So, this, this, so the answer to the first question is yes, there's an explicit formula. And, the and, 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 and an add on to that is there's also an alternative dynamical viewpoint, which is kind of nice. And if, if you, if you if you fall in with a homogeneous flow crowd, I mean, they're always proving theorems in number theory using homogeneous flows, um, which are just a variant on a higher, a higher rank variant on this kind of geodesic flow on the modular surface. What a rambling answer, sorry about that. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? If not, uh, then we'd like to thank all the speakers for this morning for all the very interesting talks. Uh, so, we would like to thank Romain for the organization too. So thank yes. you, Romain. It was a pleasure to see you. Hopefully we will meet uh, very soon in face to face. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for attending. Yeah. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.